I don't think it's too much of a stretch to think that the Old Testament priests don't quite grab us the way that other biblical figures do. David and Goliath has a better ring to it than the high priest and the Day of Atonement. Jesus healing the ten lepers just is more interesting than instructions on how to clean your tent from mold. You know, I'm pretty sure that most of us would rather read the Exodus part of Exodus than the part we read from this morning. But God spends verse after verse, chapter after chapter, book after book, telling us all about these priests and the sacrifices. It's almost shocking to realize that God spends more time talking about them than he does pretty much any other biblical figure besides Jesus. For example, the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2 is 34 verses long. It's all seven days of creation in that 34 verses. But the part of the Bible that talks about the type of clothing the priests are supposed to wear, that's 43 verses long. It's kind of interesting. God spends more time telling us where the little bells and pomegranates are supposed to go on the robe of the high priest than how he created the entire universe. And that just makes us ask, why? You know, why would God spend so much time, so much ink on these details that we think may be kind of uninteresting or unimportant? Well, our portion for God, of God's word we are meditating on today kind of gives us an insight into that. God gave Old Testament Israel the priests and the sacrifices so that Jesus could be the perfect priest and sacrifice for you. Now let's back up a little bit. If you were, while you were listening to me read, you thought that maybe we're missing a little bit of context. It's because we are. This letter to the Hebrews was written, was written to Christians who had believed in the Old Testament and had learned about Jesus and believed in him, but something was making them want to go back to their old religious, religious ways. They were suffering for their faith. And when faced with the choice of living a normal, peaceful Jewish life and a, turb- and a turbulent Christian one, it's no surprise that they were having second thoughts about this whole Christianity thing. They probably found a lot of comfort in those old religious symbols that they had. You know, they liked the priests. They liked the idea of the sacrifices. They liked the temple. I mean, they're believing in the same God, right? So what's the difference if they're Jewish or they're Christian? But this isn't a tomato-tomato sort of thing. It's right to see the similarities between these two religious beliefs, but the writer that Hebrews wants these suffering servants to see that all these outward aspects of their religious life that they held so dearly, while they might help with their current earthly problems, they really couldn't do anything about their eternal ones. And it's worth our time to see that too. Because this whole discussion about priests and sacrifices, it, has, it all starts with sin. God hates sin. He loathes it. God finds sin vile and disgusting and wrong. It's the opposite of everything God is. And sinful things just can't be around God. Nothing like that can be in God's presence. That's what we mean when we say God is holy. God is set apart from all those things that aren't like him, all those things that are sinful. And unfortunately, that list includes us. That's a big deal. Sin separates us from God. That's why at the beginning of time, just one sin cast Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. They were sinful, and sinful human beings can't not stand in the presence of God. And as a result of their sin, all people share in that same status. We're sinful, 
separate, and unholy. Lord, God's not just holy, he's also loving. And he didn't just leave Adam and Eve with their sin. He left them with the promise that he would one day save them from their sinful status. And for many years, God remained faithful to the people who believed in that saving promise. And at the beginning of this whole book of Exodus, God brings his people up out of slavery in Egypt And he wants to give them a little peek behind the curtain of what it would take to repair that relationship between God and man. Because that's it's not like repairing a sinful human relationship. God isn't satisfied with a simple my bad. God doesn't take IOUs. No, to repair our relationship with God, it requires blood. It requires death. The writer of the Hebrews puts it this way, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It's shocking, but simple. For offending our perfect and holy God, something needs to die. And so God gave his people a list of instructions of what they should or shouldn't do, what they could or couldn't eat, how they should or shouldn't act. And as part of that list he gave them, he established a group of people called the, from the, the people of the tribe of Levi called, they were to be the priests. And these priests were supposed to be the intercessors, the middlemen between God and his people Israel. These people, These priests had many religious duties they had to do, but the most important one were offering sacrifices on behalf of the people. These sacrifices would fulfill the needed sacrifice. These sacrifices will fulfill the needed shedding of blood God required. And he gave them a long list of what these sacrifices were supposed to compose of and when they were supposed to take place. There were guilt offerings, burnt offerings, thank offerings, peace offerings. And God writes chapter upon chapter, book upon book, about how these sacrifices were to take place. And the ones that the priests were supposed to pay most attention to, the ones that they focused on most, were the ones that took place on behalf of the people's sin. It would go something like this. You're an Israelite. You're an Old Testament believer. And you came into contact with something God considers unclean. You didn't mean to do it, but you broke one of God's commands to keep away from those things that are unclean. You are sinful. You have sinned. And to atone for that sin, which means cover over for that sin, he would have to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice of a one-year-old unblemished lamb. And there's only one temple in Israel, so you're going to have to go to Jerusalem, which might be a couple days' trip. So you're going to have to leave your flocks and your family and spend that time walking to Jerusalem, all that time thinking, I'm the reason that I have to go. And so eventually, a few days later, you get to Jerusalem and you walk up that hill to the temple, and it's not like us going to church. If you've ever been to one of those big cathedrals where it's all quiet and reverent and beautiful, it is spectacular and magnificent, but it's not quiet. It's filled with the sounds of death. There's people everywhere. The air is filled with the screams of animals being slaughtered, and thrown on an altar. The air is filled with smoke and ash and the smell of blood. Before you have a chance to take that whole image in, you're standing before a priest who takes that lamb from you, puts his hands on its head, and slits its throat. 
And as that animal is dying, he collects some of the blood and puts it on the four corners of the altar before pouring the rest of the blood out at the base. And once that animal has finally died, he slaughters it. He cuts off its tail. He removes all the fat from the inside, all the internal organs. And he puts those on the altar as a sacrifice and offering to God for your sin. And only once you had done all of that were you able to go back home knowing your sin had been covered over. Now, why would God have the people do that? Well, what would the people have thought through that whole process? It's unexpected, it's inconvenient, it's gruesome, it's sobering, it's expensive, and it ultimately ends with an animal dying in front of you, all because of you. That payment for sin that should have been made, that blood that, should have, that was shed, it should have been yours. But I think the thing that would be most impactful for those people going to the temple was that as they were leaving, as they were going back to their families, as they were beginning that long trek back, the realization would suddenly sink in that they were going to sin again. And they were going to have to come back and do that whole process over and over again. And that's where our sermon text comes in. We read again, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. What God was doing through this whole system of priests and sacrifices was showing them how serious the problem of sin is. The priests offer sacrifices every day. Every morning begins with sacrifice. Every evening ends with sacrifice. The shedding of blood. They could continually stand at their posts doing exactly what God told them to do. And yet the problem of sin would remain. Their sins of the people could be covered over, but they could never be taken away. They just weren't enough. But the beautiful thing about God's plan to save humanity is that these sacrifices and priests, they weren't ever supposed to be the answer to the problem of sin. No, the writer of the Hebrews writes earlier in his letter that God gave these priests and sacrifices not so that they could get rid of their sin, but so that they could look forward to the one who actually could. Our perfect priest and sacrifice, Jesus. From the very beginning, God planned for Jesus to be our go-between, our middleman between him and us. God sent his son so that he could face all the temptations of this world, so that he could listen to God's commands and keep them without failing, never faltering, not even a single step. And Jesus did. Jesus never had to make a sacrifice for his own sin. But instead, he lived a perfect life so that He could be the perfect sacrifice for your sin instead. And there's more. The big thing on the people's minds was the fact that they'd have to do these sacrifices over and over and over again. But Jesus' sacrifice took care of that too. The writer of the Hebrews says, But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Like you and I do after a long day of work, when Jesus had finished his sacrifice for our sins, when he'd offered himself up, he sat down. 
he was done. But unlike you and I who know we're going to have to get up the next day and go back to work, Jesus' work left nothing else to be done. The Old Testament priests would have to sacrifice every day knowing that their work was not going to be finished. But when Jesus made his sacrifice, he sat down and said what he said on the cross. It is finished. Once and for all. And so why does this all matter? You might be thinking, yeah, that, yeah preacher, that's a great history lesson. Jesus fulfilling the priests and the sacrifice. You know, that's all great, but what does that have to do with this 21st century, with my life, with my struggles? It's really a blessing that God helps us see how serious our sins are. He shows us that we don't stack up to his standard of perfection. We don't We don't live in the way that God wants us to live. We're not perfect. And that leads us to repent of our sins. And that's a really good thing. But sometimes our sin can make us feel like we do after we do some spring cleaning. You know, you spend a few days clearing out your house or your garage, cleaning out all the junk, making everything ready for the year to come. But as you're putting that last box up in the garage as you think you're finally finished with all the work you have to do, that realization sinks in because you know you're going to have to do it again next year. Because no matter how hard you try, you just can't get rid of all the clutter. The clutter of our sinful lives can so quickly become disheartening Our lives can feel like this cycle of sin and repentance and sin and repentance and sin again. Our pet sins can quickly become monsters that we can't control because we know ourselves. As soon as we turn from one sin, we're turning right to another. We can so quickly lose heart and ask ourselves, did I even really mean it? Am I even really a Christian? Can God love a person like me? My friends, God's plan to save you never depended on anything you do or any way that you feel. We read again, For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That's you. That's you. God sees you as perfect. Not because you feel genuinely sorry for your sins or because you promise that you're never going to do them again, but because when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin No, he sees his son, his perfect and holy son who wants nothing more than for you to be in heaven with him forever. And so God credits Jesus' perfection to you. Your God doesn't hold your sins against you. The writer of the Hebrews quotes Jeremiah and writes, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. If you ask God to give you a list of all your sins, the God who knows all things, you know what he would say? I don't remember. And that's not because he forgot, but because Jesus took them all away. And nailed them to the cross. Jesus' sacrifice is all encompassing, all sufficient, and all for you. There's nothing more you need to do, Jesus 
Jesus has done it all. One of the more humbling things I've learned in my study of God's word is that God doesn't inspire people to write things that don't matter. On every page of scripture, God's perfect truths are expressed. Things that we need to know, we need to love, and we need to cherish. And they all point to his son who offered himself the perfect priest as the perfect sacrifice all for you. It was always all for you. May we never forget that beautiful truth that Jesus did it all for you. Amen.